Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I've got a few things I'd like to say. First of all, I would like to walk you through exactly what the American Health Care Act is. I want to walk you through exactly what this health care law is and what we're replacing and how important it is to repeal and replace Obamacare, not just because the law is collapsing, but because the law is going to get even worse if we do nothing. Let me show you what our problem is and what we're trying to do. We're going to repeal and replace Obamacare, and we're going to do it with a three-pronged approach. Number one is what we're talking about right now. This is what the Ways and Means Committee marked up this morning, what the Commerce Committee is in the middle of right now. That's called reconciliation. That's the American Health Care Act. There are only so many things you can do in that bill because of the Senate floor rules reconciliation. You can't put everything you want in that legislation because if you did, it would be filibustered and you couldn't even bring it up for a vote in the Senate. Number two, administrative action. This law, Obamacare, has 1,442 sections or instances that gives the Secretary of HHS enormous amounts of discretion to administer health care, meaning I don't think Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi, and Harry Reid, when they crammed this bill through, ever thought Donald Trump would be president and Tom Price would be the Secretary of HHS. So number two in our three-pronged approach, administrative action where the Health and Human Services Secretary deregulates the marketplace and allows more choice and more competition to come into the marketplace. Number three, and this is where I think there's a lot of confusion all over the map, additional legislation that we feel is important and necessary to give us a truly competitive healthcare marketplace. So think of things like interstate shopping. That's a reform that we long believed in, that we think is really important to get regulatory competition to give people even more choices. Association health plans. Let a farmer buy her insurance through the National Farm Bureau plan, or a restaurateur buy his insurance for he and his employees through the National Restaurant Association plan on a nationwide basis. Let small businesses buy their insurance through the NFIB plan nationwide. We would love for that to be in this reconciliation bill, but the rules in the Senate don't allow that to happen. So we're going to move those bills independently. We're going to move those bills at the same time through our process and bring those to the vote. Unfortunately, they'll have to hit what we call the 60 vote threshold. So we have a three-pronged approach, a three-pronged approach to repealing and replacing Obamacare. Let's get into why this needs to happen and why it needs to happen now. Options are disappearing fast. This law is in the middle of a collapse and people are quickly losing their choices. In 2016, the amount of counties in America that had three or more insurers, three or more carriers to choose from, was about 2,000. In 2017, that number has plummeted. Insurers are leaving the marketplace. Choice and competition is going away, and people are having less choices. How many insurers, how many counties in America that had just one insurer? A little over 200 just last year. So in America, about 200 counties had only one plan to choose from, one insurer. This year, in 2017, that number has skyrocketed to over 1,000 counties. Over one in three counties in America, you've got one plan to choose from. These insurers probably never intended on being monopolists, but they are in these counties. There is no choice, no competition, one plan to choose from. It's a 454% increase in American counties of people who are stuck with one option. Now that Humana has said that they're going to pull out of the marketplace next year, they're going to be counties that will have zero options. So here is what is happening under a law that is collapsing. Premiums are going up and going up at a very, very fast clip. Options and choices are going down. So what we're seeing in America is people who have to go buy their own health insurance are getting far, far fewer choices down to the point where they have one in, a th in one out of three counties in America and the price they pay for that coverage is going up and up and up. Take a look at what's going on around the country. This just shows you a map of the premium increases just this year alone. Minnesota, 59% increase in their health insurance premiums. Pennsylvania, 53% increase in their health insurance premiums. Tennessee, 63% increase in their health insurance premiums this year alone, over one year. Alabama, 58%. Oklahoma, 
69% increase in their health insurance premiums. Nebraska, 51% increase in their health insurance premiums. Arizona clocked in at a 116% increase in their health insurance premiums with Obamacare. Here's what's happening. Quote, Obamacare is in a death spiral. It is not getting any better, it's getting worse. That's the CEO of one of America's leading health insurance companies, Aetna, said this just a couple weeks ago. What is a death spiral? It's a weird term. It's kind of gruesome if you ask me. A death spiral is a system where in an insurance pool, only sicker people who absolutely have to have the insurance buy it, and healthier people who want the insurance won't pay those really high prices because it's too expensive and they don't absolutely have to have it because they're healthy. So in any kind of a pool, typically you have a healthy person paying premiums to subsidize that sick person. But the way they set up Obamacare, it's not working that way. So only the people who must have health insurance, the older and sicker person's buying it, it's cranking up the cost of the insurance so fast that the premiums are just spiraling out of control and the insurers are losing so much money that they're just pulling out of the marketplace. That's called the death spiral. It is literally an actuarial or mathematical collapse of the insurance markets. That's what America is facing today. If we simply did nothing, just washed our hands of it, if we in the majority party said, you know what, the Democrats gave us Obamacare, let them live with it, the collateral damage in this country would be awful. More and more people would see even higher premium increases in 2018. More and more people would just see zero choices. We can't do that. The goal of health care reform has always been one we all share. The goal of health care reform is people get access to affordable coverage. Our goal is use choice and competition, not government coercion and mandates. So here is what we propose. Here is the American Health Care Act, the bill that is moving through the committee process through regular order today, the bill that's going to take three weeks just to move through the House because we are following regular order. Lower costs, more choices, not less, patients in control, universal access to care. These are the four driving principles that we are focused on. Lowering the costs, giving people more choices, having patients in control, and universal access to care. Let me walk you through how exactly we propose to do this. These are long-standing conservative principles that those of us who've been working in healthcare for about 20 years have been fighting for, dreaming about, working toward, now we have an opportunity to do that. How do we do this? First of all, you've got to repeal this law. You've got to repeal the taxes in Obamacare. It's a trillion dollars in taxes on Obamacare that make it harder to make medical devices, that make it harder to lower costs in health insurance, that drive up the cost of health care. The spending. The spending in Obamacare is getting out of control. It's a debt explosion. But more importantly, the way the system works is it's driving up the costs and the mandates. The mandates are arrogant and paternalistic. It is the government at the federal level telling people, this is what you have to buy. It's going to be really expensive. You must do it. If you don't like it, tough. That's what the government is saying to Americans today. So we get rid of the taxes. We get rid of the spending. We get rid of the mandates. The key thing that a lot of people want to know, when I do my listening sessions, when I talk to people with various disease advocacy groups, is they just want to know that when we pass this, the next day they're not going to lose their health insurance. That's not going to happen. We pass this law, and the day after, Americans who have insurance aren't going to lose it the day after. We need to have a stable transition to conservative health care reform, and that's what we're doing so that we do not pull the rug out from anybody who is enjoying some kind of coverage they have today. So we want to have a stable transition. And a few of the points that I think are really important to just bring peace in mind to Americans who are concerned about all that's going on here is we want to protect people with pre-existing conditions. We think that that's very important. That has actually been a cornerstone of Republican health care proposals all along. In 2009, I, along with Congressman Devin Nunes, Senator Tom Coburn, and Richard Burr, offered the Patient's Choice Act. It was one of our alternatives to Obamacare. Again, like many other Republican alternatives, we had an answer for people with pre-existing conditions, and we have one here. All of our Republican health care alternatives have always agreed with the idea of letting young people stay in their parents' plans until they're 26. We can retain that. What our goal is to do is to provide universal access, 
to quality, affordable health care. Here's another issue with Obamacare. Obamacare is not just the individual market that you think of the Obamacare subsidies. It was also a taking over the Medicaid program. Here's the problem with Medicaid. Medicaid is a program that is Washington controlled and it is done in such a way that it stops innovation and, 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 and experimentation at the state level. It makes it harder for states to customize the Medicaid population and the Medicaid program to work for their particular states. And as a result, more and more doctors just don't take Medicaid. I mean, what good is your coverage if you can't get a doctor? And that is a huge growing problem with Medicaid. Medicaid is also growing at an unsustainable rate, so its ballooning costs are threatening the very viability of the program and our fiscal future. So what we propose is to modernize the Medicaid program. Modernize the Medicaid program along the lines that we as Republicans have been talking about for years. I think it was Ronald Reagan in like the 70s when he was governor who said the states should take over control of Medicaid. Every budget we have had as Republicans. When I was budget chair writing my roadmaps or the path to prosperity, every one of our Republican conservative budgets said, let's get Medicaid control back to the states. In an honor to the principle of federalism, give the states and the governors the freedom and the flexibility to customize the care for their low-income populations how they think needs to occur. Our problems in Wisconsin are a whole lot different than the problems they have in New York or in Nevada or in Utah or California. So we propose more efficient spending, bring the spending on Medicaid to something that is sustainable so it doesn't go bankrupt, and have a safety net for the most vulnerable. Give local control to our states and our governors so that they can craft and customize Medicaid to work for their populations. How do you protect people with pre-existing conditions? I think this is probably one of the most um, important issues of them all. Here is basically what happens today. Under the current system, we have costs driving up. On the current system, options are going away, as I just described. Choices are fleeting, prices are going up, and under the current system, the, the fatal conceit of Obamacare is that we're just going to make everybody buy our health insurance at the federal government level. Young and healthy people are going to go into the market and pay for the older, sicker people. So the young, healthy person is going to be made to buy health care, and they're going to pay for the person you know, who gets breast cancer in her 40s or who gets heart disease in his 50s. So take a look at this chart. The red slice here are what I would call people with pre-existing conditions, people who have real health care problems. The blue is the rest of the people in the individual market. That's the market where people don't get health insurance at their jobs, where they buy it themselves. The whole idea of Obamacare is the people on the blue side pay for the people on the red side. The people who are healthy pay for the people who are sick. It's not working, and that's why it's in a death spiral. Here's how we propose to tackle this problem. We want to have a system where we encourage states with federal funding to set up risk pools and reinsurance mechanisms. So for example, in Wisconsin, we had a great risk pool that actually worked so that people with real high health care costs and diseases and pre-existing conditions could still get affordable health care. Well, Obamacare repealed that. They had a great risk pool um, reinsurance system in Utah, a good one in Washington State. All those are gone under Obamacare. Here's how they work, and here's how our system would work. We would directly support the people with pre-existing conditions. Let me give you a sense of this. 1% of the people in these markets drive 23% of the costs. 1% of the people in the individual health insurance market drive 23% of the costs. So a reinsurance program is to cover more than just the 1% to cover the people who have high health care costs. So by having state innovation funds to go to the states to set up these reinsurance programs, we would directly subsidize the people who have pre-existing conditions. Direct support for the people with pre-existing conditions so that everybody else has cheaper health insurance. What you do when you do this is the individual market, the people who don't have pre-existing conditions, they have much more stable prices. Let me give you an example. Uh, take a small business that has 40 employees. Let's say that four people in that business get cancer. Well, under that business, that business has to pay for all those cancer patients, all those cancer treatments. So the other 36 people in that 40-person pool have, uh, get hit with much, much higher premiums to pay for the four that got cancer. That's how insurance works today. And that is one of the reasons why this thing is going bankrupt. Here's our solution. Let's make sure we just cover the people 
who had pre-existing conditions. Make sure that reinsurance or risk pools kick in for those four people in that small business that get cancer, subsidize that coverage, and what you do by doing that is you dramatically lower and stabilize the price of insurance for everybody else. So those other 36 people in that small business have predictable prices, lower prices. That brings you more choice, more competition, and lower prices for the vast, vast majority of Americans who are not in the pre-existing condition category. So directly subsidize them through state-based risk and reinsurance pool programs that we would finance with, with support from the federal government to attack this problem and let health insurance stabilize, go down in price. Here's another thing that we think is extremely important. One of the problems we have is we don't really have a consumer dynamic in healthcare. People don't always care what things cost or how good care is going to be because they don't get that information. We actually immunize or, or block the ability for people to actually see what things cost in healthcare or to act like a consumer. Let me give you an example. Jana and I have three kids. They're 33 months apart. Uh, we call them Irish triplets. <laughs> Our three kids had three tonsillectomies over the course of three years in Janesville, Wisconsin from the same ENT at the same hospital. At each one of these times, I tried to find out, what's this tonsillectomy gonna cost? Never could I get that answer to that question. I only found out what it costs months after those procedures when I got various bills from the ENT, the ear, nose, and throat doctor, from the anesthesiologist, from the hospital, and the variation of price between those three procedures from the same doctor in the same hospital within three years was huge. One of them, the recovery bill, the recovery for my son, he sat in a lazy boy, ate jello, watched SpongeBob for two hours, that was $1,400. I mean, this is stuff is crazy. We don't shop like this for anything else we buy in our life. Why should we shop like this for health care? And so what health savings accounts achieves, this is the law that I helped write in 2003, something that we as conservatives have been fighting for for the whole time, is we want to increase health savings accounts, which is what we do in this bill, so we have more competition and lower costs. Here's the point I'm trying to make. In 2000, I got LASIK surgery. The reason I can see you all so well is because in 2000, I got this LASIK surgery, which was elective. Insurance didn't cover it. And so I knew exactly what the procedure was going to cost up front. And since then, this eczema laser that does this procedure has been revolutionized three times, and the price is lower. So in this area of healthcare, quality went up and costs went down because I cared as a consumer what it was. So it's not that that dynamic cannot happen in healthcare, it's that it isn't happening throughout most of healthcare. And what health savings accounts does is it helps hardworking taxpayers get access to affordable solutions to help them pay for their out-of-pocket costs, but it's also their skin in the game, their money. If they save money by saying to a hospital or a doctor or a healthcare provider, what is this gonna cost me? Where's the best value for my money? If we can bring that consumer pressure to bear in healthcare, we can dramatically enlist the support of millions of Americans to help us fix this healthcare problem. And that's one of the critical things we're trying to achieve here. Instead of using OPM, other people's money, to pay for healthcare that you don't care what things cost, we want to harness the power of the marketplace, the power of the consumer, of the patient and the doctor to demand better services, to demand better quality. We want transparency on price, on quality, and an economic incentive to act on that thing so that we can bring consumers to the bear. This is what we say, this is what we mean when we say we want a patient health care system. Okay, here's a really important part of our American Health Care Act, refundable tax credits. I want to explain exactly what we mean when we say this. Under the current Obamacare system, we have a Washington-controlled system with skyrocketing premiums and dwindling choices. It's a death spiral, it's collapsing, government makes you buy what you want to buy, and it's an open-ended subsidy for a lot of Americans. Our solution is a portable monthly tax credit. This is why we believe this is the right way to go. We want a market-based system which will give us lower costs, more competition, and more choices. There's a real problem in the tax code today in that the tax code discriminates against people who don't get health care from their job. If you're working and you're not on Medicaid and you have a job that's paying you 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour and that job does not give you health insurance, there's nothing that the tax code does to help you buy health insurance. If you do have health care from your job, you have an open-ended tax benefit. 
So what we're saying is that's really kind of not fair to the, to the man or woman who's working at a job that doesn't get health insurance offered to them. Let's equalize the tax treatment of health care and give people the same kind of tax benefit to go buy health insurance if they don't get it from their job. And giving a person a monthly of, of portable tax credit gives them the ability up front to go buy health insurance of their choosing. And here's the key. You buy what you want to buy. If you don't want to use your tax credit to go buy health insurance, you don't have to. If you don't want to buy this plan, you want to buy that plan, go for it. It's your choice. It's freedom. It's called free market health care. The states get to set up their own health insurance systems. The states get to set up their own regulations so that you can buy whatever you want to buy where you live. That is called patient's choice. That is called a patient-centered system. And that is one of the biggest tools we believe can be used to replace Obamacare. This is part of replacing Obamacare with a system that works to give everybody universal access to affordable coverage. Now, here is where we stand. The current system is riddled with endless regulations that are driving up costs and limiting choices for consumers. And you see how the collapse is occurring. Our solution, greater consumer options. The patient is the nucleus of the healthcare system. We don't want insurance companies becoming monopolies looking for favoritism in a cronyistic way at Washington. We want health insurers, hospitals, doctors, all providers of healthcare benefits competing against each other for our business as consumers. That is how the great American free enterprise system works in all other aspects of our lives and our economy. That's what should work in this system as well. So the result, you choose the plan that meets your needs. You buy what you want to buy, not what the government tells you to buy. So our goal here is final as this. Lower costs, more choices, patients in control, universal access to care. Um, there are two points I would make in conclusion. We as Republicans have been waiting seven years to do this. We as Republicans who fought the creation of this law and accurately predicted that it would not work ran for office in 2010, in 2012, in 2014, and in 2016 on a promise that we would, if given the ability, we would repeal and replace this law. How many people running for Congress and the Senate did you hear say that? How many times did you hear President Donald Trump, when he was candidate Donald Trump, say that? This is the closest we will ever get to repealing and replacing Obamacare. The time is here, the time is now, this is the moment, and this is the closest this will ever happen. It really comes down to a binary choice. We now have the ability, through the budget rules that we have in the Senate, with our three-pronged approach, to actually make good on our word. We told people in 2016 what it would look like when we had the chance to replace Obamacare. That was a better way plan. That's what this is. So we said in 2016 to our citizens, to the American people, to our constituents, if you give us this chance, this opportunity, this is what we will do. Now is our chance and our opportunity to do it. Questions? Chad.